championship. Uh, what are your impressions of the East course so far? Uh, well, I hadn't played it before, so uh, I didn't know what to expect. Obviously, I'd seen some of the 2013 PGA and some back highlights, and uh, obviously knew it was a challenging golf course, but uh, you can tell with this with this redo, they wanted to make it a little extra extra difficult. It's I would say obviously comes to no surprise. I get a very similar vibe and feel around the golf course that you could get at Beth Page or at Wingfoot, uh, since we're so close to both those courses. Um, tough course, you know. It's whoever is setting up the golf course can have a lot of fun because there's a lot of a lot of opportunities in the holes with uh, with tee boxes and pit locations. So you can make this golf course as difficult as you want or. Not as accessible as you want, but obviously you can make a big difference uh, in the scoring. So I would say so whoever did the, the redo it's, has done a good job. It's, it's challenging, but it's one of those where if you hit the shots you're supposed to hit, put it in the fairway, you know, go towards the center of the green, nothing crazy should be happening, right? But it's still challenging. So um, I like it. Fun golf course. Difficult, but fun. Great. Thanks. We'll open it up for questions, starting with Dan on five. Rory was in here a second ago making that wing foot comparison, namely because you can kind of run it up to a bunch of the different greens, and, and he said, you know, we, we know what kind of style of golf won there. We'll see what kind of style of golf wins here. Do you feel like it's going to be a week that plays into kind of who can fly at the furthest and drive it the longest? Uh, I think, I mean, throughout the history of the game, hitting it far has always been an advantage, right? Uh, maybe a little bit more so nowadays. It's always going to be beneficial to have the swing speed, right? If you miss a couple of those fairways, like one, ten, holes are not the longest. Uh, but if you miss the fairway, you can put yourself in a tough situation. People that hit it long might have a short enough club to attempt to hit it to the green, right? Um, I don't think it would be quite like Winfoot. You do have a couple holes where they do give you the opportunity of hitting iron of a tee and a wedge. That wasn't the case there, many of them. Uh, I think it was only on five or six. So it's there are similarities. It's not quite the same. The greens are not nearly as severe, right? Uh, they, they are kind of square-ish for the most part. You do have an open in the middle, but uh, not in all of them. I think it, it, it will give you the opportunity, but, man, if you don't hit it through that gap, that some of the holes is quite narrow. Those bunkers are no joke, you know. If It's never going to stay in the upslope. It always goes down to the flat, and it's always some severe slopes. You know, you're most likely going to be short-sighted. It's, it's a tough golf course, but I do agree with what he meant in the sense of, Having a really good short game week, which is the same thing Phil and Bryson did at Wingfoot, will give you, a, obviously, a massive opportunity. Everybody will miss fairways. Everybody will miss short greens. So if you can get those up and downs, obviously, it's not only a confidence booster, but it's it's something that will keep the round going. Mike, one? Almost seems silly to ask because you're coming off such a strong run of golf, but how do you feel about your game? Where's your confidence level right now? <laughs> I'm confident. I feel good. I feel good. It's uh, it's been a great year. It's been an amazing year, uh, and I'm just hoping to keep keep adding more to it. It's um, it's been a lot of fun, and I, hopefully, I can keep that. I can keep riding that wave. Is there anything you've been working on specifically, or really just maintenance? I mean, middle of the season, nothing groundbreaking. I would say you know, there's always little things we all want to improve, but. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's all what's going on between the ears on the golf course more than than technique at this point of the of the of the season. Let's go, Doug on twelve, followed by nineteen. A couple of things, John. Um, given this is a game of, of of ups and downs throughout a career, what's the worst down you've ever had? Because it doesn't seem like there's that many. Uh, I would say somewhere between. Somewhere maybe in 2018, 19, maybe I didn't have my best stuff. Um, some people might say part of last year as well. Uh, I wouldn't think so, but I think some, yeah, 18, 19 would have been, would have been it. What was going on? I mean, nothing special really. I just <laughs> didn't play as good as I would have liked. Okay. Secondly, I, I think there was um, great curiosity with the press and the public, and probably some of the players about how the how the, the, the live players coming into a major, how that was going to go. How much do you think, looking back, the Masters is, has has helped if it has kind of returned to some some normalcy, I guess, of just coexisting? 
I'm, I'm the wrong place. I'm the wrong player to ask. Yeah, but you're the only one standing there. So. I know, but like I really didn't. I didn't really care in that sense, right? I never got into the feud. I've never had any negative feelings towards any player that went over to live. In fact, I've mentioned many times I'm still plays with many of them, and uh, still try to figure out, try to play practice runs with Phil. Uh, play with Taylor Gooch yesterday. I mean, it really doesn't make a difference to me. So. Um, I couldn't. That's why, in my point of view, nothing changed. I think I said it at the Masters where I hadn't realized how long. I think the first person I saw was Dustin from Live, and I hadn't realized how gone it had been till I looked down and I saw him wearing foot joys. And I was like, okay, this, <laughs> this doesn't add up. And then I realized I haven't seen you since the Open last year, right? That was my first moment. So, um, again, to me, it's like nothing changed. You stand out because of your play, but also just in terms of you and other players in the field, you're also physically taller than them, your build, your your frame, your stature, all of that. Are there advantages and disadvantages to that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think, like I mentioned, there's going to be, if, if you ever need to tap into a little bit of an extra power, having the size always helps. But not, you know, there's plenty of golfers that are not my size who can hit it quite a bit further than me. So at the end of the day, is how you can create speed. Uh, the, the one disadvantage, not that necessarily happens on this golf course, but when you get uneven lies, you know, ball below your feet or just funky areas, having the, having longer legs is not always a good thing. Uh, but that, I would say, is very, very small percentage of the situations that happen in golf. Now, for uh, John, another live question. We're a couple weeks away from the one-year anniversary of, of their launching. Uh, if you have to look into the future, where do you see you know, professional golf? And... I have no idea. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to tell you. I mean, uh, it, it all depends who you talk to, right? If you talk to a lift player, oh, this is going to be great. It's only going to get better. You talk to other people on the other side, and in two years are going to be done. So I really couldn't tell you. I have no clue. I really have no clue. Um, I... <laughs> I really don't know what to say. Obviously, uh, they're trying the hardest to be a little bit different, and it could pay off or not. I, I really don't know. Mike, one. John, you mentioned. Yep. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> John, you mentioned how uh, this week will be about the short game. How does Oak Hill test your short game? Oh, I said it could be. Obviously, you know the two guys that went at it till the end last year were in the longest hitters. So obviously, ball striking could be a very much a premium, right? But um, it's going to test you in the sense that, I mean, a couple things happen when you miss the green, right? Three that stand out, and it's obviously the obvious three, but you have those runoffs everywhere in a lot of the greens, right, where you can hit a really good shot that it basically goes 10 feet off the pin, and now next turn you have 30 yards with big slopes. Those fairways are very well manicured. They're fast. It's not the easiest shot to hit. Then you have the the other side of the corner right, where it's, just thick rough. Thick rough where, you know, you depend a lot on the lie and, and a little bit of lack sometimes. And then um, some of those bunkers, right? I mean, there truly are some bunkers out there that sometimes you can rely on the sand to give you a little bit of advantage, but they're deep and they're tough and they're very well placed. So a little bit of it is not luck, but strategy, right? Knowing where you can miss and where you can't miss because you can't be hitting great shots all day and land the ball less than 15 feet from the pin and give yourself absolutely no chance to get up and down, right? So it's it's a bit of everything that goes combined with it. When it comes to those runoffs, how do you account for all the different kinds of shots you can play from there? Well, it all depends on which one and where you are. Some of them won't even give you the chance to stay in the fairway, right? Uh, if you miss it right of 15, some of the spots we saw yesterday, it just goes all the way into at least that little first cut, which limits your possibilities. A couple of all those, I think it was 14 and 15, 14 long, 15 right, the steep bank actually had a thicker, it was basically a semi, a semi rough, right? So that they take in the putter and the bump shot out of your hands for a reason, right? Um, a couple others will give you an opportunity. Like if you miss it left of one, it's not the worst runoff. You can actually putt it. Uh, you can actually stay in the fairway unless it's, you know, it's going quite a bit left. Uh, there's a couple others like that. Um, you know, it's it's all circumstantial. There's so many possibilities. I would say for the most part, the later on the week, if it doesn't rain, most of those balls just won't stay in for a while. It'll just keep on going to the rough, and that will be a really tough spot to be. Let's go to Mike 10, followed by 11. John, over here. 
Uh, you were talking earlier on, John, about um, riding the wave for the rest of the season, and Rory was in, in here earlier saying with the major schedule being really compacted, you could potentially, a player in good form could win two or three, maybe even four majors. How excited does that make you for the prospect of going forward? Very. Uh, it doesn't happen often that a player wins more than one major in a year, so it would be amazing to be able to, to join my, my name to that list. Right now, latest to do it that I can remember was Brooks, was it 2019? So before that, Rory in 2014, it just, it just doesn't happen often. Sorry, Jordan, 2015. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to, yeah. Hey, John, you're a student of the history of the game, and I'm curious, were you familiar of Walter Hagen that he was born here in his early contributions to the game of golf? Oh, obviously, I'm familiar with Walter, uh, but I don't know. Like, I usually get into tournaments and what tournaments they won and certain shots, but... I think it was a little early for any cameras to be recording a lot of that. So I haven't seen much. And, you know, surprisingly, it's not really a name that jumps up to a lot of people when you talk about the history of the game, right? Um, and I'll say a lot of people wouldn't even know if it wasn't for the legend of Bagger Vance. So um, probably my fault that I don't know as much as – I don't know. I really don't know what it is. I wish I wish somebody could tell me at some point. A quick follow-up. Um Players often speak about patience during majors. Rory said it was going to take discipline this week. Mm -hmm. What well, one word would you say it's going to take? I, I agree with what Rory said. I think discipline is a really good way to describe what one needs this week. Great. Let's go to 15 followed by one. John, talking about the history of the game, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with the number of people who have won the career Grand Slam. How big of a goal is that for you in your career? And now that you're halfway there, how much more do you think about it? Not that much more. Um, obviously, if I want to win this week or the Open Championship, it really becomes a true reality. But winning two majors is not easy, and picking which ones you win is, is a little ludicrous to think about. So... Uh, I think obviously winning the, the Grand Slam would absolutely be amazing, but I think, God, without sounding too conceited or too arrogant, I would rather focus in more on the number of majors you win than having the Grand Slam per se, right? Uh, obviously it would be amazing, but the more you put yourself in that position to be able to win majors, the more likely you might be to get it done, right? But it's a very small number of players to do it, um, last one being Tiger, so it's... Obviously not an easy thing to accomplish. John, every, every player is different, obviously, but mm -hmm. what do you think the keys are for avoiding a, a major letdown that's, that's plagued some of the other players over the past decade? A major letdown? What do you mean by that? Like a, a hangover. Like letting a Masters big oh. for instance, carry over. Uh, I wouldn't know exactly, honestly. Um, Obviously, it's a big deal when you when you get to win one. So, uh, try to enjoy it as much as possible. I would say, because it's very easy nowadays, especially with how much golf we've had this season. To like once you finish, you kind of put your thoughts on pause to keep performing right. So, I think try to enjoy it and process it as fast as you can might be the best way. But at the end of the day, this is our job, right? So. You're here to perform, so trying to focus on that as well. I wouldn't know exactly what to tell you, honestly. Uh, I guess it could be a, a, a feeling of content after you win a Masters. Um, but, you know, you can't let that become the main thing because you have three more majors during the year and the players and the FedEx Cup and many things to accomplish afterwards, right? So um, a lot of it, I would say, is how goal driven are you and how you assess your goals throughout the year. I can tell you of many possible thoughts. I just don't know which one would be best for, for who. Man. Mike, too? Both of you? <laughs> <laughs> A few weeks back, uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo had this answer that went viral about not predicating success and failure strictly on the end result. Uh, how do you kind of define that dynamic of success and failure and then has that changed at all given this run that you're on no i fully agree with what he said 
in the world of sports, especially in basketball, you either win a championship or not, right? You can't define a good year by just, okay, you got bounced in the first round. I mean, that's, you're talking about losing four games, right? On the grand scheme of things, it's a small number. So I, I really fully agree with what he's saying. You can't, especially in golf as well, just because you haven't won something doesn't mean it's been a terrible year. And that's kind of what I was saying last year, right? Uh, and it would be very similar to what Tiger might have said in 98 in the middle of swing changes. You can't declare you're a success. You can't be improving in many parts of your game in certain aspects that might pay dividends down in the future, right? So just because you haven't accomplished something today doesn't mean it's going to pay, pay off in the future. So, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, it's especially in golf. I mean, Jesus, we <laughs> you don't win very often, right? So... It's you got to focus on on what the positive is each week, and and you can call a lot of weeks a success that maybe public or media wouldn't think, but just because of what's going on internally. John, um, earlier you spoke about wanting to ride the wave that you're on, and I thought the word wave was interesting because when you look at the best players recently, Rory, Spieth, Kepka, they do seem to have a wave where they crest and then it kind of inevitably comes down. Do you think that pattern is inevitable in golf today, or do you ever think about a way that maybe we can sustain sort of the, the high water mark? It's the best metaphor I could figure, I could find <laughs> in a couple seconds after asking that question. Um, I really, I mean, it's sports, right? And the path to success, I think Ar- Arnie said it, the road to success is always under construction. It's not a linear, constant path of, of, of improvement, right? It's, it's up, ups and downs. And it's, I mean, it's not only in golf, this is life, right? The next day is not always better than the previous one. It's just impossible to think that way. It's never going to happen. So I uh, just got to deal with it. It's, it's, again, it's sports, right? Um, I wouldn't know what to say. Like, uh, that, that's all I can tell you. It's, I think it would be ludicrous to think that you can always keep increasing your level of performance. That's just impossible. So there's going to be downs. Again, like I just mentioned, even Tiger had downs, right? So maybe his downs were shorter. Uh, maybe his downs were different in his mind, but everybody had them. It's, it is part of, part of sports. Now I'm hoping, I guess as a player, you got to hope that your low is not as low as, as all this. That's, that's all I can say. Let's get to a few more here for John. Doug, followed by Dan. Do you surf? No. Okay. When you, uh, you mentioned... Looking at tape from from 2013, um, I'm curious. Do you find yourself going back at previous majors, whether it's Wingfoot, Kiowa, Southern Hills, before a major you hadn't been to, to, to watch video? And and what was the one thing that stood out from from what you saw of Oak Hill? Well, I've done video. it. I do it for pretty much every major. I just like it. And even if it's not major season, I'm doing it at home. Right? I've seen. You should surf. I've seen on. On social media, about every Sunday round you can find about Augusta and most majors. Uh, for the most part, majors, home majors would do like a one-hour documentary of the entire tournament, right? I mean, you, you'll see a lot of – and it's not research. I just like it. I don't know. It's fun. I'm a golf fan as well, right? I'm a fan of all those players that are out there as well. So it's, it's enjoyable. Now, what you've seen in 2013 might not be applicable to right now because it's a different golf course and it's a different time of year. When they played, it was very soft, and those fairways are not soft. It's playing very differently, right? Uh, the one thing I did see from Duffner is he, you know, when he needed to, he relied on his wedges quite a bit. Uh, I think in the final round, I think it was nine or eight, hit it on the trees, cheaped out, gave himself a 10-footer, made the putt, and kept the round going, right? So as well as maybe not always going for it, I think he laid up on 14 and trusted his wedges. He He gave himself numbers, and even on that final round, he had about – three or four tap-ins for birdie. Um, and that usually doesn't happen, right? Uh, so, again, I think that goes with what Rory said, just be determined, uh, have discipline. Uh, a bit what Jack did, and I think it was in, uh, how where was it? In Bodrestal, right? How he said every time he went in the rough, he was going to lay up. And on 18, he laid up, hit the one iron, and then made birdie, right? There's many ways to make a four or three or a five. It's just you don't always have to go at it all the time. So I think uh, there's always a lesson to learn in everyone. John, do you think that staying above the fray, not really getting into the feud, as you mentioned, you've, you've kind of you know, hold anything against anybody, do you feel like that's helped your golf over the past year? 
I don't know. <laughs> I just, like I said, some people are friends, and some of the players that went are friends, obviously, and I just, it's not my place to judge what they do with their life, right? I can agree with it or not, but I'm not going to be judgmental in that sense. Obviously, there's some things in life, some values that I believe in that I might judge if you if you compromise, but that's is your choice, is your career, is your life, is, is your family. You do whatever you want. So from that point of view, I'm nobody to tell them what to do. That's why I would never get emotionally invested on something like that. I mean, it's it's a life. I don't know what to say. It's just I, I've never thought about it that way. I, I guess the question, the better question would probably be: Do you feel like if if you were more invested in it, that it would it would take something out of you or, or not? Probably. Allow- probably, yeah. I mean, you're. <laughs> I would say. If it was me, I could possibly possibly be investing a little bit of time and energy onto a few that's not necessarily player versus player, right? I don't have a personal issue with them, and there's no reason for me to make it. But, yeah, I think it could take – I mean, it would. Over a, a year, yeah, I think it could take some, some energy out of you. We will wrap things up with Juan. Okay. Well, John, otro PGA Championship, ¿no? Otro campo difícil – Además con frío esta semana, los, las, las ventajas de tu juego aquí y qué es lo que va a poner a prueba, si quieres. ¿no? A ver, al final esto va a jugar... Dep- depende de cómo lo preparen, pero lo pueden preparar muy difícil, ¿no? Pero es más... parece más otro US Open que otra cosa. Al final es como jugar en... Win- es, es casi como en Winford, pero estamos a cuatro horas de Winford en coche, ¿no? Al final es parecido. Eh, lo que he dicho, ¿no? Todo depende de cómo lo preparen, porque hay ciertos hoyos como el 3, el, el 11 que si ponen el tía atrás son hoyos dificilísimos y te dan un palo más corto no son fáciles pero un poco más asequibles no así que no sabría qué decirte en ese sentido pero hombre al final hay que jugar bien hay que hay que ser certero desde el tee y digamos tener cierta disciplina con las decisiones que uno toma no así que creo que hombre me viene bien le digamos al jugador con mayor calidad le va a venir bien pero al final es quien juegue mejor no Si no juegas bien, no estás del todo cómodo con el swing, va a ser muy difícil las reacciones. Oye, después de los últimos meses, cuesta no recordar Oakmont 2016 y tu visión de lo que iba a ser tu carrera, ¿no? Sí. Y tienes la sensación de que se están cumpliendo esas cosas, ¿no? Muchas de ellas, sí. A ver, yo dije lo que dije, lo que he dicho siempre. Una cosa es lo que yo quiera conseguir o lo que me proponga conseguir y otra cosa es lo que consiga, ¿no? Digamos, si yo me propongo simplemente ganar un grande, puede que llegue, puede que no. Pero si me propongo, digamos, ganar 100 torneos y 25 grandes, aunque llegues a 30 torneos y 7 grandes, sigue siendo una gran carrera que cuando termine diré, lo he dado todo y estoy muy satisfecho. ¿No? Al final para mí es darme objetivos que, que hagan que cuando yo me despierte cada mañana, incluso los días que estoy cansado y no quiero, hagan que yo mentalmente piense... Hay que ir al campo, hace frío, llueve, no, hay que ir al campo a entrenar porque es el objetivo, ¿no? Es, es un poco a lo que me refiero y, y bueno, de momento sí que voy a decir, una, una carrera muy, muy buena de momento en 6-7 años. Hablad, esos objetivos también van con, con lo que tienes que hacer para prepararte, ¿no? Uh-huh. Y, y tanto físicamente como simplificando cuántos torneos juegas, tu calendario y todo esto. Después de lo que ha pasado ahora, Masters, y ¿estás cambiando un poco tu estrategia con esto? No, este año estás muy limitado en las oportunidades que tenemos, ¿no? Al final hicimos el calendario a principio del año y, y no, que, no es que tengamos mucha, digamos, mucha, no, no sabría decirte, no tengo, muchas, no, no tengo muchas posibilidades, ¿no? De, de, al final ya, ya he fallado uno de los torneos que me podía fallar y el resto los, los tengo que jugar, ¿no? Así que eso te limita. Eh, pero al final la decisión está hecha tomé la mejor decisión que yo podía que yo podía tomar así que de ahí ya es trabajar y punto es lo que hay no al final somos de los pocos deportes de que hay hoy en día que deciden su propio calendario así que tengo la suerte de poder decidir lo que yo quiero digamos aunque esté un poco limitado este año no eh, sí tú lo has dicho al final es eso no o sea darte esas ganas de, de ir a por ello cada mañana Bueno, hablando, lo último, hablando de esas ganas, ¿cuántas ganas tienes esta semana y cuál es tu visión para esta semana? <risa> Hombre, ganas muchas, obviamente. Es, es un, es... Ah. He hecho algo grande este año y, y de ahora en adelante es simplemente hacerlo mejor, que ojalá pueda seguir sumando, ¿no? 
eh, ahora que estoy pensando igual, igual David sabe no sé si Sebe algún año ganó dos grandes en no. un año, no, sería el primer español en hacerlo pues ahí te lo he dicho ¿no? siempre soy alguien que tiene objetivos pero hay veces que cuando tienes un año muy bueno hay que ir, digamos sumando o reenfocando y eso sería una gran manera de mirarlo, ¿no? Al final, ¿cuántas personas han ganado cinco veces con dos grandes en un año? El último que yo me acuerdo es Jordan Spieth en 2015. Esto es algo que, sea, que es muy difícil de hacer y que ahora de momento lo único que tiene oportunidad de hacerlo soy yo. Así que ojalá pueda, pueda seguir sumando a esa historia. Muy bien, gracias. Gracias, John. Gracias.